This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast, episode 93. Today, I am joined by Daniel Wallace, and we are talking all about how to run events and how to run events for authors. It is a really interesting discussion, and you'll hear me uh, pick his brains <laughs> um, because I am interested in running uh, author events. And yeah, I guess I have some epiphanies, and it's also interesting even if you don't particularly want to run author events because he has some very interesting ideas around like giving customers more and deliver over delivering I suppose so join me for that but first to last week's question which was which part of publishing do you enjoy the most um Ian Worrell said I actually like the writing part uh yes I I kind of assumed that all of us <laughs> preferred the writing part but I suppose I was after um finding out like of the logistics of the actual publishing, like which bit do people find uh, most enjoyable? So I think that was the only comment. Harley Christensen also said, that, uh, well, she quoted Dan, uh, who was my guest in episode 92, and said, um, I love this. Um, the quote is, most of what I do is give authors permission to be themselves. Uh, and that was Daniel Wilcox on what advice he shares most often with his coaching clients, which I also thought was really interesting and um, I've even had some conversations this week about around like giving ourselves permission to do the thing. Uh, so yeah, I love it. And um, yeah, so that was last week's question. All right, this week's question is, what are the best author events you've been to, whether that's digital or in person? So yeah, I'm really curious, like not least because I like going to events. And so I'm curious what you guys um, have enjoyed, uh, whether there's any conferences or digital things that I've missed out on. So yeah, I'm really looking um, partly for your like suggestions, but also your recommendations from a selfish point of view. So yeah, please do come into the Rebel Author Facebook group and answer that. All right, the book recommendation of the week this week is The Science of Storytelling by Will Storr. So I spent a lot of June in a bit of a fog when it comes to reading. Technically, I read, well, Goodreads says I read 12 books in June. I didn't, I read nine, I think. Uh, but because my own books finally got onto uh, Goodreads, the side characters one. Oh yes, <laughs> if you want to add side characters to your Goodreads profile, then it is live on there now, so you can do that. Uh, but because of that, and I think there was another book that went on there, it conflated the amount that I'd read. So I think I really read nine books, and uh, but it says 12. Um, but that is significantly lower than what I have been reading. I have been reading upwards of 15 books a month. And so oh, I just feel like I spent the whole of June not reading. Um, and also because I didn't really read many books that I really loved. And so I fell into a, a bit of a, fo a funk, a reading funk and a bit of a hole. And I even tried reading really famous books. So I read Neverwhere, which I did like and I did think was good but it didn't like the beginning of Neverwhere was fantastic uh but I just by the end of it I just felt it sort of fallen a bit flat for me the world building was astounding but it didn't pull me out of the funk the reading funk that I have been been in and so yeah I don't know I just need to find a book that will pull me out of my reading funk um and get me reading at a rate of knots again because obviously I don't know if I said it on this podcast or if it was just on the next level authors podcast but my goal is to read 100 books this year and I think I'm on 68 so I think Goodreads says 67 but there's another book that I've read that's not been published yet so that will be 68 yeah and you know I have obviously yeah Anyway, so I'm getting close and we're halfway through the year, so I'm definitely um, ahead, but I am worried because I'm in this reading slump and I can't seem to get out of it. However, on to the recommendation of the week, which I have half started telling you about. Um, I started reading The Science of Storytelling by Will Storr. I'm only about 40 pages in, but oh my goodness, it is fan 
fantastic, mind blowing. Um, it starts out, I mean, you, it clearly will go into storytelling more, but it looks a lot at like the psychology of storytelling and it's looking at what our reality is and it is deeply, deeply fascinating. So I'm really enjoying that and I'm going to try and binge read through that this weekend and finish up a couple of other things that I've been reading and hopefully that will kickstart me but yeah maybe if you have a book that has pulled you out of a, of a prior reading slump I'd love to know what it was. In personal uh, updates I can't remember what I told you last week this seems to be a reoccurring thing uh, so I finished recording the audiobook of Villains and I am now in the last week almost done with the editing as well so in terms of stages I'm basically editing out all of the mistakes and the breaths and all of these things and then I've got a few things that I need to go back and re-record so I am hoping that by the end of next week I will have finished editing and finished re-recording the mistakes um, and then I will be at the point where I'm proofing it by the end of next week which will be the end of like the first full week of July so I don't know we, what are we today we're the 2nd of July today so by the 11th of July um, I should be handing it to the person who's going to be doing the mastering um, and so then I hope that means I will be loading it up shortly after that I know the mastering won't take very long so perhaps the end of the following week essentially by the end of July I will be oh I'm also releasing side characters so maybe I'll push it into August but anyway uh by the end of July early August I should have the audiobook of villains uh, live as well so that is super exciting I will be looking for people who want to review the audiobook so I'm I don't quite know all the mecha mechanisms behind credits and things but uh when I'm at the stage of trying to load it and all of that stuff I will look at the mechanisms of credits or free whatevers and then yeah I will be looking for reviewers so just um, keep an eye out an eye out an ear out <laughs> keep an ear out listening for that all right so um not entirely sure what else there is to tell you I have got some live events uh that I will be discussing uh and but I will tell you about those next week so that's for the launch and there's some very exciting stuff I'm doing some lives and things on Instagram but I'll go into more detail about that next time um what else am I doing um I am as I've mentioned I'm working on finishing the audiobook I've already said that and yeah just launch stuff and hmm. oh yes my non-fiction secret non-fiction project um I'm drafting that in the mornings I haven't quite decided like the angle or the hook in which I want to talk about it so um until I've that's the only reason it's secret. It's not like some big, you know, super secret thing. It's just that I haven't like intellected enough on, you know, so I talk about side characters as side characters, but I don't quite know like what that angle or hook thing is. So as soon as I've got that, I will talk to you all, all about that. Um, and I, yeah. So one other thing obviously is the Rebel Diaries anthology. That did close. I just want to apologize because I don't think I was clear enough. I know I mentioned it in a couple of podcasts but I perhaps didn't put it on all of the information. The closing date was the 30th of June at midnight but that's midnight my time. Um, if I were to do it midnight America time I would have had to have like woken up at four o'clock in the morning or something um, to to turn the thing off. So you know that was a mistake on my part for not being clearer. Um, we are a global world, um, but yeah. So, uh, you know, the reason I'm saying this and the reason I'm apologizing is because I had quite a number of people reaching out to me who were, uh, who wanted to to submit uh, right at the last minute. Uh, and unfortunately, midnight, their time uh, was past midnight my time. And so the form had shut. So yeah, I, I want to apologize that I wasn't clearer um, and that, you know, your story didn't get included. Um, like I say, there were more than a handful of people that this happened to. So yeah, please do accept my apologies on that part. Um, but, you know, that's a lesson for me. Hopefully, maybe you guys will take a lesson from that too. But the other thing that I want to say is that your story is not lost, it's not wasted. You can do still many things with it. Um, you could 
submit it to another anthology or submit it to a magazine or even publish it yourself. So don't be disheartened. Um, yeah, so just, <laughs> I'm sorry that I wasn't clearer about uh, the deadline. So for those people who have submitted, um, there are a lot of submissions, uh, many more than I anticipated. So it is gonna take me a little bit of time to go through those. I will be emailing out to everybody who did submit uh, with information on what happens next. Um, and yeah, I am both equally excited at the prospect of getting to read all these stories and kind of terrified about how I'm going to narrow it down to like eight or 10 or 12 entries um, for the for the final book. So yeah, thank you everybody who took the time for uh, to enter. I really appreciate that and I can't wait to talk about it more as we get closer to uh, completion and publication. Rebel of the week this week is Ian Worrell. Ian says, uh, this story involved my family's dog that we had had for 14 years. One time, my brother's girlfriend was on a work term in New Brunswick. She came down to visit him for a weekend and had brought two dozen blueberry muffins that she had baked. They put the muffins on the coffee table in the living room and went into the kitchen to boil the kettle for two cups of instant coffee. Well, in the time it took them to do that, the dog got to the muffins. After I heard about this, I was away at a summer job at the time and I said to my brother, I, I hear Sparky had a little muffin feast. My brother closed his eyes and drew out a breath. He ate 22 blueberry muffins. His girlfriend would later say that the dog was pretty regular for about a week after that. <laughs> Oh, I love a little doggy rebellion. What a cheeky dog. I can't believe he managed to eat 22 muffins in uh, in that short space of time. That is spectacular. I love it. If you would like to be a Rebel of the Week, please do send in your story. Uh, we are always, always, always in need of Rebel stories. Uh, so yeah, please do send them in. You can email your story to rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or Instagram me at Sasha Black Author. All right, we had a whopping bumper week of patrons this week. So thank you and a huge welcome to Cassie Emerson, Kelly Burrows, Lynn Reed, John Rind Rindflesh the Ninth, and Elizabeth Price. Thank you so, so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. And I want to extend that huge thank you to all of my existing patrons. Um, I... Uh, you will you get access to all of the episodes early and also bonus little things sometimes i send um uh, outtakes or i send motivational audio sometimes uh, i run random sunday sprint days um i also run the poison and pro sessions for patrons and if you are on the five dollar and above then you get access to the slack community as well which is a buzzing little uh, environment uh <laughs> That is, that is one way of describing it. I love you guys so much. So yes, thank you to all of my patrons. I really, really appreciate it. If you would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, as well as bonus content, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. All right, that really is it now. Uh, let's get on with the episode. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I am joined by Daniel Wallace. Daniel is the host of the online writing summits Escape the Plot Forest and Style and Voice, which I had the honour and pleasure of speaking at. His superhero origin story, uh, he spent four years of a PhD researching new ways to teach fiction writing, and he now shares those techniques on his newsletter and his online course. Is. He is also the editor-in-chief for Burlesque Press, and his work has appeared in McSweeney's Internet Tendency, Tampa Review, Air Schooner, Schooner uh, and many other places. He is sadly not the Daniel Wallace who wrote the novel Big Fish, and nor is he Daniel Wallace, MD of Boston, whose patients regularly email him requests for medication. <laughs> That is a hilarious bio. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Sasha. <laughs> so and you, of course, were you were amazing in the summit. Just, oh, just get that clear you. out of the way first. <laughs> oh, stop. No, carry on. No, I'm joking. Um, uh, yeah, oh, thank you so much. Um, so tell me about Burlesque Press. Is that is that a saucy press or? It's it's not actually um, saucy. We get a lot of questions about this. Oh, my that's a shame. Wife, yeah, my wife founded it with this idea of, 
burlesque being kind of like riff, like uh, a cr something creative, something offbeat. Uh, and we published a series of books. Uh, if you, if, if the video is on for people listening, you could see some of them um, behind me. And we we published a series of really great books. It was it was wonderful. And so my role was the books editor, the technology, the getting the book laid out, editing things like that was great. Aha. Uh -huh. And um, that, so I didn't even know that you could do a PhD in researching new ways to teach fiction, but I fucking love that because my whole, like my whole nonfiction career, if you like, is all about teaching, not like fiction yeah. in a quirky way, because like, so I am, I don't know, I don't know, and you can tell me about your PhD, but I get so pissed when writing craft books are so dry. Like, yeah. why are they dry? <laughs> Fucking writers. We should be able to write shit in a funny, engaging way, right? Uh, so tell me a bit about your PhD, because I'm fascinated to hear about this. Well, I want to be clear that, that doing a PhD is kind of an intense decision. I don't know if I recommend it for ever or even for myself. Um, and in the US, it's even longer than in the UK. Like in the US, it's like a four or five year, some people six year commitment. And so it's a bit like going into space and you come back and, you, and everyone's, everyone around you is older after you, when you get back. It's, it's, a, it's a strange thing. Um, I... I, I was just, when I did my, my MFA in creative writing, master, you know, master's degree in creative writing, I was probably really silly in that I just became fascinated in like what we were doing in the classroom. Like we kept having these workshops and I kept thinking, there's got to be a different way to help someone like write a, write a novel. Like we would, I would see people bring in short stories and it was kind of, it kind of worked. Like, you, you know, here's my short story, 15 pages long. What do you think about it? And people would get a lot from that. But with a novel, you bring in like 15, 20 pages and people would just give all kinds of advice because like, you know, the novel could go anywhere. Who knows what, what the next 20 pages would look like? And so my decision, the PhD, which is really like to focus on this, it didn't make me completely, like it was a little um, uh, strange for the people teaching me. I think they were like, my God, another essay from Daniel about creative writing. Um, what, you know, what is going on here? But it was incredibly useful for me and some of those, and I remember one book that now I don't even think I could read because I was so, I was so into that kind of world of reading narrative theory and form. And it really just blew my mind. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Um, there's a book called Reading for the Plot um, by Peter Brooks. And it really got me thinking of like, oh, wow, there are, I could teach this in an interesting way. So what kind of, and sorry, I, I, I because I am also, <laughs> equally geeky you're not going to get away without talking about this a bit more um and also I'm going to write that book down just because I am that sad definitely um can you tell me the name again <laughs> it's called reading for the plot reading for and the plot. In, and it sounds like obvious in the in the normal world but in in academia it was, it's kind of like a spicy title because it's like the idea that you could read for, for, for the plot is kind of a controversial kind of claim in some academic circles and this moment he was talking about great expectations and he he was talking about the, the the plot twist in great expectations where pip suddenly realizes that he isn't due to inherit all this money become rich marry the girl he thinks he's in love with he's actually got this criminal who's been sending him money from australia and and this and the, the the writer peter brooks talks about like how all this buried stuff in the novel that's been it keeps being reminded to you that that like the things that Pip thinks are happening are not really going on. There's all these weird mysteries that keep being popped up. And then, and then, and then, so he says like all the sort of buried stuff in the novel comes back at the plot twist. And I thought like, wow, that's really good. So what, what techniques did, and we will start talking about um, writing events in a second, but so when you say you're, you you were researching new ways to teach fiction, so does that mean that you feel some ways are outdated? Like what ways are better than other ways? Just talk to me about that a little bit. Well, a lot of what I came up with is that it was this idea of reading people's work and feeling like a lot of people would were, a lot of aspiring writers were just not narrating enough. And this is a bit like some of the things you talked about in the plot summit, actually, when you talked about the, the hero lens, that like, I found that so many 
aspiring writers work, you couldn't, you just couldn't figure out what was going on. There was like a lot of events happening. And so what I developed is this idea of what I call character first writing. And it's the idea that the main character is the ambassador to the story. The main character is like what helps the reader make sense of really everything in the story. And so working out a way to plot as, as a via this relationship. So the plot is developing the reader's relationship with the main character and the scenes are developing, are developing and sustaining this relationship. Ah, oh, I love that so much. That's definitely like there's some uh what's the word synergies with the hero lens there for sure I love that and I love that we came at that from two completely different angles but more or less came to the same conclusion as well okay we are here to talk about uh writing events and organizing writing events so first of all do you want to um tell everyone a little bit about the events that you personally organize yeah that's great so um I have I, I mean, it's all, this, this has all started in the last year. So when I say I, ha I have these things, it's just, it's just this first year, but I run a now annual event for writers based around plot called Escape the Plot for Us. And it's four da days all online. And every talk is about plotting, narrating, storytelling. Uh, and I bring in a whole bunch of different, some great writers to deliver sessions and just share their expertise. The other event, which you, Sasha, were a great part of is Style and Voice. It's all about writing style and building up your writing voice and kind of like how does voice fit into the writing process. This was a real like passion topic for me. Like I love researching things about writing style. And a long time ago, I wrote a series of essays about it and it got picked up on Reddit. And it was one of my first like online, like people, I thought people were really interested in this. So that's, those are the two events that I run as, as like true online events. Now I also, and I want to come, I'll come back to this later. I also uh, have begun a free event that, that I run with my wife that's called Secluded. And that's a little different. It's more to the creative writing, um, academic, academic adjacent writing world. And I did that kind of like as a trial run for these events. And that was a, of a totally free event. And so we did that in June last year and it was really good. And it made me think, okay, I understand the technology. I can understand like keeping this thing organized. Now let's try and do this like for real. And it, it worked really well. Oh, that's awesome. Let me ask you about the Reddit um, articles. Did you compile them into a book? I did. And I, it's, it, that's my free book that I, it's okay. now, so that writing that I did years and years ago, I turned it into a free ebook that people can download. And it's been one of the, the most popular things I've ever written. Um, I don't know how many, I mean, it's got to be at least, I don't know, 10,000 people that have downloaded that book now. Uh, it's been, it's been a great, it's been a great benefit. And, and it was all ideas that other people had created. And I just try to simplify them. Cause as you say, some of these books are very dry mm. and they, and particularly writing style books can be very complicated to understand what it is they're talking about. And so I think that's what people really appreciate about this, these essays. Awesome. All right. So where slash how do you even start? So let's say like somebody wants to run an event for writers, like where, where do you even, it's such an enormous like behemoth of a task. Where do you start? How do you start looking at this as a project? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And I would say that one thing that I would think about is what's one aspect of writing that I really love talking about? You know, what's something that I find really fascinating? This is what I did for the plot summit. I know that I can, I could talk to 20, 30 other writers over a week and be fascinated by everything they were saying, have thoughts about it, be able to help the listeners and readers, the viewers understand what was being said, draw connections. And so I think that that's like a really great place to start. Like, well, that's one really great place to start. Like looking at something that you find passionate, that you find that you're passionate about, that, uh, that seems easy for you to talk about and people enjoy hearing from you. Like, I think we all know there's a few things that are 
audience really likes to hear about or friends like to hear about. Uh, the other thing I would say is that th you can make your first events or even your 10th event really simple. I think sometimes people get really hung up on the technology, on all the different moving parts, on comparing yourself to other people in this world, other events you see online and think I've got to have X number of attendees. I've got to do this, I've got to have that. And, you know, you can just make a web page with six Zoom links and say, here is the event. And, and you know, people will come. Okay. I, I am one of those people who like will overcomplicate and I'm like I will start with a seed <laughs> and then all of a sudden like my seed has become this giant mushrooming monster and then I'm like oh I can't do this and then I back away and don't do it so I think that's really sound advice to keep it simple and that is <laughs> something I, I mean, struggle to do. Yeah, so I think that's great advice. I can I can just say that for me, I have enormous imposter syndrome, fear, lack of confidence, and so I delayed doing this for a really long time, and and that was part partly I just kept thinking like, oh well, I've got to be more famous, more successful. I've got to have more things somehow to do this, and uh. I think that it's really, like it's a really terrible way to treat yourself. And I think it's easy to sort of, for me personally, at least, to imagine all the things that could go wrong and give them enormous importance. I will just say one more thing about this is that there are lots of platforms out there that help you, that help you design one of these events. And it's not, they're not that expensive. I used um, a platform called Hey Summit, which you can look, everyone can look up, heysummit.com. And it's not that expensive to get started. Uh, there's also webinar platforms like bigmarker.com that can like let help you create the sort of framework, the pages a lot, a lot easier than people might think. Yeah, that is definitely one of the things that uh, puts me off or like it's, it's just that fear factor. And I'm putting barriers in my own way, I think, because I think these things are going to be difficult. But actually, usually there is a technological solution that will simplify everything for you anyway. Um, OK, so. I like to be reflective and mm -hmm. uh, look at the journey and always make the next one better than the last one. So have you learned from any mistakes that you've made? Or if not, um, have you seen anybody else making mistakes or, you know, have you attended conferences and, and seen mistakes that you then avoided uh, in your own uh, events for writers? That's a, great, that's a really great question. I think that the biggest mistake that I made is, first of all, wait, waiting too long. Like, I, I think for anyone who's thinking about this, who wants to create an event, you know, the, the best thing I can advise you to do is like, just do it uh, and make something really low stakes that can't fail. Like find your friends who are, who are writers who could give a talk and then see if someone, other people want to come and watch for free you know, you, you will be so much more confident after you've done that. Uh, I think that also it's really worth investigating your own fears and self-sabotaging once you get going. Because something that I do, which is really terrible, is I get, I get nervous that it's not going to work. And so I delay doing critical things until, say, 20 people have signed up, 50 people have signed up. Like, say, I delay speaking to more speakers and reaching out to more people because I'm like, well, I can't reach out to Sasha until I've got like, you know, 50 people, you know, have bought the early bird ticket. And that is disastrous because then it's like, there's not much time left. And then you have to apologize to all those, to the people you're emailing. That's, that's, that's one thing. The other thing I'd say, this is a real, this is th that is that um, if, and, and this is, um, I don't, this is a little intimidating sounding, but when you do one of these events, particularly online, you, you may not be aware of how much email emails, how many emails you're going to get from the audience. Like if you have a 3000 person event, there are going to be emails all the time um, from, you know, and you could be up at your 3 a.m. changing something on the site 
and someone will email you from India or Paris and say, why have you changed it? Like what, what just happened? And if you run like any other kind of writing thing, business, whatever you want to call it, at least for me, I was not prepared for this. Like, like I was not prepared for that level of emailing and, and, and customer support. That um, makes me giggle because emails are my biggest, they're like the bane of my life. Okay, I hate well. my inbox. I am terrible at replying. I try now to only reply on Wednesdays and Sundays just because I get so many emails that need personal responses. Um, yeah, but yeah, that is not something I could ignore if I was running an event. So I might have to, yeah, investigate some solutions for that. Um, okay, so I think some of the things that make events amazing are the small details and yeah. like the nice touches. So what do you think, what nice touches or small details um, do you think set a writing event apart? Yeah, that's a great question. And I spend a lot of time thinking about that because it's, and you can you can sort of think to yourself like all I'm doing is creating a bunch of videos that people for people to watch and it feels like it feels when you're doing something like this online it can start to feel a little surreal people are giving up a weekend of their time a week of their time just to watch some zoom calls uh, and you also are always aware that there's like a million videos on YouTube that people could watch all about writing and so it's like why why come to your event why why be invested in the event so I spend, I spend a lot of time thinking about this. One of the things I think is really good to do is to give people some kind of uh, reward, free resource, free things when they sign up. So that as soon as people sign up, there's like, here's a free book, here's a free guide, a, a something, a, 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 here's a video that we recorded early. I think that that keeps people kind of engaged, keeps people thinking like, okay, this this person's paying attention to me. I'm not just another, I'm not just ticket 86. Um, that's one. Two is that in the plot, in Escape the Plot Forest, my first big summer is that I taught or spoke to the, the whole event every evening. And that worked really well. It helped to give people, I think, or people said, give gives people this feeling of like, I'm in a, a, a a flowing event that makes sense to me and that is cares about my development as a writer and not just like here's another set of videos for you to watch people really responded and it felt like in those sessions just because i was the host not that you know you know just because i was the host and like was there available visible responding to things people seemed to really connect to that one of the other things that i uh, really liked about the style and voice summit was the community so like one first of all when they were live sessions you had like the chat box in messenger um in zoom sorry and then when it was like a pre-recorded you had a messenger like forum chat thing on the website which i thought was fantastic because it really i think community is everything and so that obviously encourages people to then have discussions between themselves um so yeah i thought that was i thought that was awesome um all right so I mean organizing these things is lovely and of course you are meeting new people um if you're the host you're getting to network in the industry um but it takes a fucking long time to do um and it is a yep. bit of an arse ache so yep. realistically you know as the organizer you're going to need uh, some kind of compensation for just the extensive number of hours that you're going to have to put into this you know we all have mortgages to pay so um how can someone make a revenue stream out of running writing events yeah that's a really that's a really great question uh it's a huge amount of work to do one of these summits and it takes months and so you, you how many you hours wanna... do you reckon you spent Go i don't on. i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to think about it because it's 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 a lot i mean it's it's fun work like it's it's reaching out to writers you wouldn't you know you maybe wouldn't have never you would have never contacted because you feel shy it's it's talking to people about writing, it's building the site. It's, it's kind of fun, but it's it, it's a lot. And one expert who um, I um, 
I follow says like, it, you know, 90 days, you, you know, start the event, nine, start planning the event at least 90 days beforehand. Um, and I think that that's like a pretty accurate, pretty good piece of advice for people. Um, oh, should I? So, so to me, there's like two models and to make money. The first and the, the easier to understand is something like a workshop or a class, a paid class. And there you charge a certain ticket price and you just, and, and the good news is that your, your, your costs are really low. Like if it's you teaching class and you're using Zoom, your costs are close to zero. It's not like being in real life where you have to pay for, you know, coffee and, and snacks and, and, and rent out a hotel, hotel sort of studio area. It's, it's very low cost. And the difficulty with running a workshop is getting enough people to sign up. And so if you have a big email list, social media following, you're really famous, you can probably get enough people for one of these workshops, but it becomes challenging to keep running them because you're sort of offering the same thing to the same people. That can be a challenge. The summit model is interesting because it, and it takes a minute, it takes a little, like 30 seconds to explain, but the summit model is interesting because it encourages other people to get involved and help you develop the summit and promote it to their audiences. And the model is, and I, this is a completely by the book model, other, other people invented this a long time ago, is there's a, it's free to watch the event live and it costs money to watch the replays. And people slice that up differently but there's like a, as a pass that people have to buy for a certain amount of money, usually under $100, that lets people watch it at their own pace. And what I did and what is the general principle is you contact a, a lot of people and say, if your audience signs up, then we'll split the ticket price. Some, for me, it's 50-50. Other people, it's like 40, you know, 40% to the present to the promoter. And what that means is that the other people who you're talking to um, have, you know, find it easy to tell their, their audience, their friends, their followers about the event because it's free. You're not saying like, hey, this is total stranger to you, Daniel David Wallace has got a $200 workshop. You should go and pay for it. You're saying it's a free event. If you want to go check it out, it becomes a lot simpler and easier to present that to people. And then when people come, they, and they like it, if it's a good event, they rapidly realize I cannot watch 20 sessions in four days. And even if I could, I want to watch them on repeat. And so then you have, you know, as long as you have a fair number of a fair percentage of people, say 10% of the 10%, 15% by the pass, you, 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 make, you make a good amount of money doing one of these events. And then the last thing I'll say is, I re, what I really like and what people have told me over and over again is really good about this, is that it's still inclusive for the people who can't afford the ticket. So, and that's something that I really appreciate and like about the model. It's kind of like a wacky model to explain, but for, for there, are, there are always going to be people who just cannot afford even a $47 price. That's just, that's just life. And yet they, if they're willing to put the time in and the attention in, they can take part in the exact same event that everyone else is taking part in. They can learn from the same people and it doesn't like hurt the organizer at all. So I, that's something that I didn't quite expect to appreciate so much, but it's been good. Yeah, I think that's um, I think that is a brilliant uh, explanation of the models. And of course, I, I suppose the term that people use is affiliate marketing. And that's definitely yeah. something I do a lot of affiliate marketing. Um, but the one thing for anybody considering uh, either running or being a part of an event, I will say is you should always, always, always be honest um, if you are affiliate marketing. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I do is I only ever promote thing, 
things that either I've taken the course personally, because I take a lot of courses, um, or I am part of the event. So I am speaking, which is the case in, in, in your conference or summit, sorry. Um, or it's something like I use and love like Scrivener or Vellum, for example. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, because obviously when you do promote somebody else's event, your you are placing your reputation on the line based on their event um so you can damage yourself if if you're promoting something that isn't you know top quality or or whatever i i completely agree and i think that one thing that when you want to go back to one of the things you talked about like nice touches and small details one of the things i try to really stress to people who are involved both as speakers or just supporters affiliates is like let's not over promise Let's not say ridiculous things that we can't deliver on. We don't make, we don't say like this conference will get you into the New Yorker. Blah, 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 blah. And like being really clear about what people are getting. And, and similarly, like with this whole free versus pay thing, saying like, you know, being open about that, like, you know, hey, you're more than welcome to stay free, but I want to be honest, the best experience is paid. And people don't get upset about that. What they get upset about is when things are being, you're not being honest about what you said you were going to do. Exactly. I completely agree. All right. So one, I used to run events for bloggers and I'm one of these people that sits on the line between introvert and extrovert. So I think in a very extroverted way, I love to bounce ideas off of other people, but um, people drain me massively. (laughs) Um, So we saw family over the Easter break. And so there were like six people in our garden. Actually, I think it might've been eight people in our garden, whatever. Anyway. Um, And I had to take myself off because I was just by lunchtime. I was absolutely fucked. I was so tired. And that's one of the things that uh, running events I used to struggle with. Um, So I guess my question is like, what kind of a person can run an event? Do you have to be an extrovert? Can you be an introvert and run events? Like, and what considerations, you know, do you make any considerations for that? That's a great, that's a great question. And I've, I a long time ago got, got the, you know, the introvert extrovert test and I score very highly as an extrovert. So I might not be the best person to answer this, yeah. but I can, I can say that the, the experience is draining. Like, like the, the experience you're describing, of like, I need a break. And one of the things that's challenging is that when the event is over, like, you know, the very last session is done. You're like, goodbye everybody. And you close it down there's still more work to do. There's a lot more sort of administrative stuff and, you know, post event things to to take care of. And yet every single time I'm completely just run down and exhausted. I get nothing done that that next week. And it's just this like rebuilding the self, rebuilding the ego after interacting with so many people uh, so frequently. So one thing that I would say that I would recommend everyone do is have a friend or hire somebody who you can pass on customer support questions to. I did that for the second summit and it was just such a relief. It was just so good. I have a, v, a wonderful and brilliant VA, uh, Leo, who, um, you know, some questions I'd answer myself, but others I would just be constantly forwarding. Leo, could you handle this? Leo, could you handle this? And that is such an emotional uh energy saver and if you're an introvert i i really recommend like you know if nothing else like find an extroverted friend and just say please help me you know for a few hours that's something that i'd recommend uh the other thing that i'd say is you don't need to be constantly uh chatty you don't need to be in the audience's face you can sort of step back and let these other speakers and teachers and experts talk I think the thing to be showing people is, is more like you just, you really care about them. You care mm-hmm. about their experience. You care about what's going on. You're excited by the talk. Like you appreciate a really good session. And, you know, when, when something weird happens, this is a bit stressful. When something, te- there's a tech problem, you're kind of, you, you're still calm and you're just like, hey, everyone, we'll be back in a few minutes. That's more what people are looking for rather than the life and soul of the party. I don't think that's necessary. Mm. Um, uh, so another question, like what are the most important considerations that you need to make when organizing a writing event? Are there any accessibility issues? Are there any time zone issues? Like how does, what things did you have to consider? 
Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, the time zone problem is a massive problem. And I don't, I really don't know what the solution is because uh, when you do an online writing event, there are people in the Australian time zones that want to take part. And at least where I am, I'm in the East Coast area of the United States, Knoxville, Tennessee. It's very difficult to organize things that both people in my time zone and people in Australia can watch. And so people are frustrated by this. They're often upset. Or other people are just heroes that wake up at 3 a.m. and start, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing the people that attend. And, you know, I think trying to come up with events that spread across the day in a like more than you would naturally think like could i start a bit earlier could i have some evening sessions could i do some pre-recorded sessions that are that start later than i would normally think like 8 p.m that i'm just sort of pressing effectively pressing play on a video and so if i'm not having to be there watching and talking and interviewing someone i think that can be really that's a really important and a really good um uh also stressing like replay value like a thing that you can't you can't solve everyone's time zone concerns but like if everything is available for either for a short time or for a long amount of time on a replay that helps some people the other thing with um yeah i mean that's that's really important with um time zones and the other thing is i've done over the over the, the both summits is multiple welcome sessions so on the first day, I will do two welcome sessions, one at my morning and another at my midday, and then have a happy hour at 5 p.m. my time. And that means that more people can get this kind of like, welcome, hello, welcome to the session. If you only do one in your morning, you've just missed a whole bunch of people. I think that's great advice. All yeah. right, accessibility. Yeah. So accessibility is a, is, is a, is a big issue. In... Um, when you have pre-recorded videos, in some ways, it's a lot easier. You can uh, get the video, use a tool like Descript. I use a tool called Happy Scribe and produce a very rough AI created transcript and then either pay someone. I wouldn't do this myself, but I, I would probably try and pay someone to just clean it up. And then you can create captions. It's not that difficult to create captions um, for the video. That, that's really important for, um, now with live, it is a little more complicated to do this with Zoom webinar, but rev.com now produces captions. I think that's really good. The, uh, the last thing I'd say, and I wanna be clear that I don't consider myself an accessibility expert. I, I feel like I've done a poor job on this so far. The last thing I'd say about this, if, um, if it's okay, is that you gotta be aware that you may have some unpleasant moments in an event like this. And I've found that in particular, people respond to female speakers differently than they do to male speakers. That people will say really unpleasant things about female speakers, like, and it doesn't happen very often, but if you have 3,000 or 2,000 people in an event, I've found that stuff happens. Is it okay to talk about? Yeah. Sure? Okay, so like I found that every so often like stuff happens, like someone will send like a really unpleasant email or people will just leave comments right in front of the speaker. Like this isn't good or like this person's to this person's speaking too slowly for me. Um, really sort of like trivial, like trivial things, not like, oh, I disagree. I actually prefer first person, like sort of trivial things about the way someone speaks. Oh, and I always get told I speak too fast. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> And, and, you know, um, and I just feel like, you know, uh, uh, sometimes this does happen with men, but it happens more rarely. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that if you're doing an event like this and you're not doing like a workshop where it's like 20 people, or 30 people, and it's like 3000 people, I would say to everyone, like, you have to be ready and, and you have to come down like really hard on the, on the attendee when this happens. Like I just delete those comments. I call the person out. You mm. say, I, I, I remind people through the day, you are not allowed to be rude to the speakers. And some people get annoyed. They're like, oh, we've already heard this, Daniel. Like, you don't need to tell us again. And I'm like, you do. And I notice that as the event goes on and attendees get tired, this happens a bit more. So you kind of have to like on like day three, say like, hey, everyone, 
checking back in. I know we're all getting tired. We've seen a lot. Let's all stay positive. Um, that's important. I, I am not shocked and shocked all at the same time. I mean, I know uh, like when I do YouTube lives or whatever, there's always like fucking trolls who want to say something shitty. Um, but also like, don't people have better things to do with their lives? <laughs> like you're attending a free event for goodness sake. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. I, I want to... I want to be very clear that like out of 3000 people, this is a very small number. Of yeah. People. It's like Most one or people two are fantastic. people. Yeah, yeah. But I would say as the organizer, it's something you need. I, I think that it's, it's, it's always been good when you just like, you just wrote in the chat, that person has been removed. And yeah. There is, an, there is a great wave of excitement and, and relief in the room. Like, Oh, you're handling this. Yeah. Like, no, I, I completely agree. have to deal with agree. this weird troll. Yeah. I know. I think that's great advice um one last big question then okay of course um you know no conference or event or summit is a, a summit without speakers yes. so what are your best tips for actually pitching speakers is it hard do you get lots of rejection like talk to me about pitching okay that's a that's a great topic it's a huge topic uh and it's something i worry about a lot because you have to you 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 have to pitch a lot of a lot of the time to run these kind of events. I would say that it's not that stressful. If you can find someone's email address, you can, you can write a letter. Um, and a lot of most people say yes. What usually happens is the people who say no, never reply. So you're not, it's not like you're even dealing with rejection. Exactly. I would say that, um, you know, at, the, the, the pitching letter that I write by email is fairly short and it, and it follows a kind of, I think probably like normal querying advice that people will give. Like, here's the event I'm thinking of, here's exactly like, like this, the, the frame of the event, what it's trying to do. Here's why I'm interested in you. Like, you know, I see you on Twitter, listen to you speak here. You spoke about this topic. You have a book about this topic that I think what people would really like. Uh, and then here's what's involved. So it's like, it's a, you only need to record for an hour. It's, and, and make it very clear, like what the person has to do. And then, you know, do you have any questions? And it can be really that simple. Now, I will say it's easier to do this when you already have an event that you can send people like a previous event. Because one thing that's a little difficult with this stuff is that when you're building the event and you're pitching people, the event look, the website looks terrible because there's, there's no speakers. And so it's, it's one reason why it's very good to do like that, that free event with your six friends that I talked about the, before is that you can then when it's time to pitch people for like for real, speech marks for real, you can show people that the speakers that previous event and say, look, I did a previous event on blank. And the last thing I'd say is the more focused the event, the easier it is to pitch people. If you've got something like how to be a writer, it's going to be really hard to contact, you know, Sasha Black and say, hey, do you want to tell people how to be a writer? But if you've got something really focused, like how to write page two, it's so easy because you'll be like, wow, Sasha, I'm reading page two of your novel. It's great. Like I've got a whole conference of page twos. Can you can you come and talk about page two? It's just so much easier. Yeah, and, and I always respond more, I think, to those requests that are specific and that when you can tell somebody knows your work, like I, I get pitched for people to come on my podcast daily and often it goes something like, oh, hi, um, I think, you know, oh, I've listened to your podcast um I loved this episode and uh oh I've got a new book out and here's why I think I'd make a really great guest a guest I'm like cool no thanks because mm -hmm. like I care yeah. about my listeners and I want my listeners to get really good quality advice and like tangible tips and tactics that they can take away so like if you want to come on my podcast this isn't about you <laughs> This is yeah, about yeah, yeah. my listeners and what I can give yeah. them. I mean, and of course, like as part of that, we get to talk about your summits and we get to promote the fact that, you know, you have these genuinely amazing events that people can still go and buy and watch and, and take part in. But, you know, so many people, do, when they pitch, they, they make it like about them rather than about yeah. like what you 
you know, in this context, it would be you pitching me and, you know, what what I would get out of being part of your summit, so so to speak. But, you know, when it's the other way around, it's all to do with the podcast. Um, but yeah, yeah, so I think, you know, that is great advice. And I can definitely, after having been pitched so many times now, I can definitely tell when somebody has researched into me and when somebody hasn't and they're just, you know... Uh, they don't know any of my books or they they're not suggesting a topic or you know because it's like I don't have time to like think of all all of the things for you people know, workshop that someone to... else's topic yeah yeah do you know what I mean like yeah so anyway I think that's fantastic advice um thank you so much okay this is the rebel author podcast so tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel you know I think uh I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to return. I already used this up in an earlier question. Oh no. I, I, you know, I think that uh, there was, there were moments in this, the very first summit that I organized where um, people, where the, the, there were some attendees being rude to speakers. And I had this real voice in my head of like, keep the audience happy. Don't cause a fuss. Pretend it's not, it's not, it's not a big deal. It's just one person or two people. And I had this moment of like, no, don't do that that's wrong. And I made a big, basically like a big stink about it in the next session I was teaching live. And that was like this, you know, maybe that's not too rebellious, but for me, it was like a moment. And it was like a really transformative moment in the event. It was like, from then on, we were a community of people Mm -hmm. and not just a bunch of people watching videos. And so I'm really grateful that my rebellious angel on my shoulder encouraged me to do that. No, I think that's wonderful. And I always say on this show, like a rebellion can be anything big, small or or something in between. And sometimes it's the tiniest of rebellions that make the biggest difference. Like yeah. that will have made your community that much more cohesive and feel protected as well, because, you know, they would feel like you are there for them and protecting them and looking out for them and their enjoyment. And I just yeah, I think that's a wonderful um, rebellion. All right. So tell everyone where they can find out more about you, your books, your events, all of that good stuff. Anything else you'd like to add? You know, the best thing that people should do is is start my website, danieldavidwallace.com. I've got a free course that teaches some of this character first writing approach that we talked about at the beginning of this this episode. Uh, People can sign up. I'm I'm working on a great book set in Taiwan, but it's not it's not ready yet to share with the world. Uh, And um, yeah, come to my site, try out the course. It, it works at your own pace. There's some clever stuff behind the scenes. So you can, you can binge the whole course in one, one very long night, or you can take two weeks to do the whole thing. And it's all about how to write a short story. Oh, <laughs> something I'm trying to do more of this year. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And of course, a massive thank you to all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, then you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. And a uh, another ginormous thank you to everybody listening. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Daniel Wallace, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm going to be joined by Angeline Trevena, and we have a fascinating discussion all about world building. She is a bit of a master of world building, uh, so join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.